Mina, I just wanted to say welcome to Film Unfiltered Podcast. We're so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to dive into so many of the different things that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. Of course. So, Mina, you're obviously very, you're multi-passionate. You care deeply about storytelling. Uh, you're an incredible actor. You've done amazing work, you know, best known for the mega successful Aladdin, for example. You have a charity. You're an advocate for diversity, which is incredible. You've launched a show. You've authored a cookbook. Uh, so we definitely want to dive into everything. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So... One of the things that are kind of top of mind right now, specifically um, the Hollywood strike. So sort of to kind of segue into that, I want to know more about your journey into breaking into Hollywood, breaking into acting. You're from here. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I wanted to be an actor since I was a kid, uh, but I grew up as uh, an Egyptian. Uh, we immigrated from Egypt when I was three and a half years old. Wow. So my parents really wanted me to be a doctor. Both my sisters are pharmacists. So the, you know, the boy in the family's got to one up the girls. So they yeah. wanted me to be a, uh, a doctor. Um, and so you know, I grew, I did that growing up and I, I do really value that. I think it, it taught me a lot, even though at the time, sometimes it made me miserable, like being in maths and sciences, mm -hmm. but I think it ended up being like a very valuable asset to me, but I did that growing up maths and sciences. I did acting on the side as a hobby. So I would do like community theater. Um, I, you know, I did uh, 12 angry men at the Scarborough theater. Uh, I played Peter Pan when I was in elementary school. Oh. Like I, I did kind of theater, but it was always taught to me to be a hobby. Right. Um, and for school I did, you know, maths and sciences. I was in AP chemistry. I went to the university of Toronto for neuroscience wow. before I transferred over to theater. And then I was sitting in calculus class one day and I was just like, I can't do this the rest of my life. Like, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for my parents. Um, and I didn't want to upset them. But at the end of the day, I was like, I I've got to just follow my dream. Like, I'll regret it for the rest of my life if I don't chase yeah. what I want. Uh, so I auditioned for theater school. They only took 30 people. And I just kind of left it up to God. I was like, if I get in, I'll do it. If not, I guess I'll continue down this path. Yeah. And so I ended up getting in, uh, really upset my parents, transferred over to Ryerson for theater school. And I think that was back in, I started theater school in 2010, 2010. Graduated in 2014. Um, but my first gig was in 2011. So I was lucky enough to have gotten an agent while I was in theater school wow! and I was booking kind of small roles here and there. So my first actor credit was Nikita. I played Al Qaeda number two. Uh, that was in 2010 or 11. And then I got a guest star uh, on combat hospital and um, I had an incredible teacher, God rest his soul, Ian Watson. He was teaching me Shakespeare and he would kind of let me go do these roles and miss class, even though we weren't supposed to. But he would let me kind of go do them um, and he would encourage me. He was one of the best teachers I ever had. He, he passed away, um, but he taught us Shakespeare in theater school. And so I kind of got my feet wet a little bit while I was in theater school and I was lucky that way. Um, so my first kind of union experiences was mm -hmm. trying to join ACTRA and that kind of whole experience. And I, at the time, I didn't really know anything about it, except that it was good for you because everything right. was union and, you, you know, the big, big jobs, you had to be part of the union. And that's kind of all I knew about it. Um, and then when I when I moved to Los Angeles in 2017, I joined SAG and that was you know, my first experience with SAG as a union right. was in 2017. So, you know, that was kind of a little bit about my journey and, and, you know, tying it in with the unions as well. Well, before we dive into the union a little bit more impressive, and it's, it's really interesting how when you choose that path of sort of what's in alignment, things can really fall into place. Getting accepted, having that realization, that's so impressive. And I'm sure people around you are so proud of you right now. So I applaud you for that, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, and in terms of, you know, your experience with the union moving to L.A., having all that right now, this is the first time since I believe it's the 60s when there's this dual strike taking place. Right. So it's causing, you know, a big storm right now. There's a lot of conversation around it. A lot of people are affected, hundreds of thousands of people and especially the Canadian film industry as well. We're, we're feeling the ripple effects. What are your thoughts on this? Well, it's an interesting time because it's not just uh, our industry. Like there's strikes going on everywhere. And right. there was, you know, UPS was going to strike. Uh, the labor unions around the world or around North America uh, were thinking of striking. And I think it's because ultimately, you know, something is happening right now where big corporations are getting big. Yeah. You know, uh, I think we know about monopolies in Canada with like Air Canada. You know, there's only mm -hmm. one airline you go to when you want to fly internationally. It's Air Canada. And that kind of monopoly uh, system is getting more and more prevalent in North America. It's happening in the United States as well. And that's why there's laws. You know, there's laws while why certain companies can't acquire other companies to prevent mm -hmm. their uh, from like anti-competition laws and, and things like that. So. I think it's interesting that it's not just happening in our industry, but we're definitely at the forefront of it uh, right. just because, you know, the union represents some really famous people. Um, and so we're we're at the forefront of it. But that I, I always think about that saying the rich get richer and the poor die trying. I think, unfortunately, that's more true now than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, during COVID, a lot of wealthy people really made their wealth even larger um and people struggled and i think now we're kind of just seeing the effects of that so you know it's 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 a tough one it's it's very complicated it's very complex but i do think that it's happening for a reason i think people are struggling i think corporations are more powerful than ever and uh, um the system's changing you know when i first entered the industry like in theater school, you know, mm -hmm. when I didn't know anything about anything, but there definitely weren't streamers like me and my roommates were still collecting Blu-rays and watching Blu-rays. That was like, oh, my God, Blu-rays. Like, yeah. they're, they're, they're incredible. Like, do you see the definition on that? And I don't think back then I could have ever imagined like now we can have like 4K stuff just streamed to our TV. Like, that's weird. And you don't own anything. Yeah. And that's another message, I think, that's prevalent in our world now like that other saying you won't own anything and you'll be happy right and that's the same with streamers like you don't own any of those movies and if one of the streamers decides to take off your favorite movie or your favorite show <clears throat> the office on netflix i know we still have it here on netflix in canada but like the office isn't on netflix anymore in the u.s mm -hmm. um people you start to realize like you don't actually own anything um and so, yeah, I think it's it's an interesting time we're living in, but uh, I think this is all happening for a reason. Well, and even to kind of go even deeper to that, look at the advances in technology and AI. There are so many different things at the forefront, right? From the streaming, that's that's part of the heart of everything going on. Everything you mentioned with the corporations, the compensation, but then AI as well. What are what's your take on what's happening in artificial intelligence? It's affecting every industry that we know, right? But especially here, actors want that ownership. What are what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, AI is definitely one of the from everything I'm reading is is one of the larger aspects of the strike and, mm -hmm. you know, why the unions are striking. Uh, I do agree that we need to be protected from that. And again, I think it's a larger picture thing. You know, I think a lot of people are going to be affected by AI. I think doctors eventually are going to be affected by AI. Um, I was looking up, um, you know, the other day, there's like, there's AI that will write contracts for you now. So you don't need lawyers as much as you used to. And so I think every profession is, is at risk. Right. And I'm grateful that we have a union to protect us because not everybody does, you know, like doctors, lawyers, other professions. I, I don't know what their union status are. Uh, but unions are there to protect you. And so I definitely think that, you know, we, we need to be protected from things like AI, especially writers. Uh, you know, I, I completely stand with the writers and feel for the writers because AI, you know, AI for actors is something that like maybe will affect us three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. 
But with writers, it's like something that's really affecting them now. Like AI can write a script for you now, right. like right now. And maybe it's not that good, but it, but it can. And so I think, yeah, we need to figure this stuff out. Uh, because like I said, the corporations are getting bigger and bigger mm -hmm. and, you know, they're going to start pushing the middlemen out because that's just, it's just the reality of any business. If you can push the middlemen out, you do it because you, you create a larger bottom line for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I do think it's important for all that stuff to be figured out. And, um, like I was saying, the system is really changing. Uh, back when, again, back when I was in theater school, the thing you always heard about was like, man, the residuals that like the actors on Friends used to make, like, yeah. and you used to hear these like insane numbers. And now being in the industry, I can tell you those numbers are are not real. Like they, they don't exist anymore. Like the residuals that you, people used to make, they just don't happen anymore. Uh, I have friends that were actors, you know, back in the 90s, back in the early 2000s. Um, and they used to make a really good living just off of residuals, even if their upfront pay wasn't that good. And that just doesn't happen anymore. Do you think there's a solution to this? For example, if things continue going, the trajectory doesn't change, what will happen? I mean, obviously, we know every industry is affected by this in some way, shape or form. But for the film industry specifically, wh what do you what do you think will happen? Well, I think we got to figure it out now. Um, you know, I think that's kind of the whole reason the strikes are happening. And I yeah. think the reason that there's such uh, strong solidarity between the actors right. and the writers and all artists is because I think we all realize that we have to figure this out now. Um, you know, uh, the other thing that works to our advantage but also our disadvantage in this you know th today um is that there's a lot of competition out there you know i think there's more competition among actors than there ever has been and i talk about this with all my actor friends and it's like pros and cons right because there's so much competition but there's also way more content than there used to mm -hmm. be so there's more opportunities for actors but because there's so much competition the the number one thing you can ask for is competition as a corporation because the more competition, the more people push themselves to be better, the more that you can have the advantage, right? And so if there's not competition on the other side, if there's not competition on the corporation side and corporations aren't competing with each other, then they have the advantage because there's not as many co uh, corporations competing with each other, but mm -hmm. all the workers are competing with each other. So you can get some pretty good deals. People can start working for not a lot of money. Um, and it's true. Like, you know, I would have, when, when I booked Aladdin, I would have done it for free because it was such a massive opportunity. And, and Disney knew that, right? Like corporations know this, they're not stupid. Mm -hmm. So when they're casting, you know, big blockbuster roles, unless they're going after A-listers, um, they know they have the advantage because they know that this is a massive opportunity for, for those actors. So, you know, they end up getting a sweet deal because of that. And rightfully so, you know, like it's, it is what it is. Like, it's true. Um, I spent a lot of time being bitter, uh, after Aladdin because of, you know, seeing the film make a billion dollars and not participating in that success. But after a few years, you start to realize like, but I would have done it. Yeah, I'd do it again for free, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, you, you got to understand and realize that what's fair is fair and, and how the world works. And, um, you know, it's just the reality of it. So that's what unions are there for. They're there to try to make things a bit more fair and protect actors and, you um, you know, uh, I, I think it's it's a necessary thing we're going through right now. Are you seeing all this happening? What's what's your inner circle kind of experiencing with this? Well, I moved from L.A., so I don't live there full time. I live between L.A. and um, Nevada now. Um, so I'm not kind of in the heart of it the, like I used to be. Um, but, you know, I'm proud. I'm proud of how people are standing together mm -hmm. and um, definitely holding their ground. You know, I think a lot of people thought that 
the unions would fold by now because their members need to work and make a living and everything's getting more expensive. Inflation is definitely mm -hmm. a real thing, especially in the States. Like you, you really feel it when you go to the grocery store and stuff. It's yeah, everything is more expensive now. You know, whether they're telling you inflation is like 3%, 4%, 5% is you can tell. If you do your own grocery shopping, mm -hmm. which I do, you can tell how much more expensive things are. Um, so, you know, I'm proud of the unions and their members that they're holding strong. This strike rather is drastically affecting everything, right? We've got the film festival coming up, for example, how that looks. There's still lots of movement there, lots going on, but that is still going to be affected one way or another. Um, you know, it's it's a conversation that continues to be be top of mind. If let's say this were to continue into January, into into 2024, what kind of effects do you think that could have on, you know, the film industry in general? Well, it's complex. And I think both sides are hurting. I think we're getting to a point now. Listen, there's a lot of egos involved, right? It's right. like when you fight with your partner, um, you know, you, you, even if you know you're wrong, you don't want to admit it right away. You spend a little bit of time just being mad at them anyway. Uh, there's a lot of egos involved, but I think both sides are starting to realize, like, we, we need to figure this stuff out mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the actors are hurting, the artists are hurting, the writers are hurting. Um, but the corporations I think are hurting too. Like, I don't know if you know, but, um, I'm a big Disney fan, uh, both artistically and, uh, financially, you know, I own the stock and the stock is the lowest it's been in 10 years. If you bought Disney wow. stock 10 years ago, um, and never sold, you'd have a, a zero net return. So essentially it's back to where it was 10 years ago. Um, that's something that I'm sure Disney's not too happy about. Like, you know what I mean? They, they have a zero net return from 10 years ago um, as of today or I think on Friday. Um, so, you know, the stock is cheap right now for what some people would consider to be cheap. So, again, I think I think both sides understand that we need to figure this out. Um, and so that's the positive of it. But on the other hand, like there's independent films that are really here. And like I have, a, I have an independent film out uh, that went to Fantasia, uh, you know, and I can't really talk about it. Uh, I can't promote it on my social media. Uh, I couldn't go to the festival uh, to promote it because it has ties with one of the big studios. Um, and it is an independent film, but one of the big st studios bought it. And so right. they're involved with it. So now we can't promote it. And so it sucks for everybody. You know, it, it really does. It sucks for the producers um, that produced it. It sucks for, I'm sure, you know, the, the studio that's involved with it, that we can't promote it. It sucks for me as an artist. Um, it sucks for everybody. So, you know, I think we're getting to a point where we've got to figure it out. And I'm confident they'll figure this out before the new year. Um, it'll take th things a while yeah. to get rolling again. Um, but I think they'll figure it out. And that's a really crappy thing about 20 the 2020s so far is like the entertainment industry and a lot of other industries haven't been able to get going like 2020 happened covid shut everything down right. you know film crews sets it shut us down for like a year a year and a half it took took us a while to get rolling and then as soon as we got rolling again it shut down again because of the strikes so the 2020s have been a a crap for our industry so far well, hopefully we can see things turn around quickly so that we can start building that momentum again. And, you yeah. know, all this passion and this drive that's being put into these projects, people can finally, you know, announce them and, you know, just feel um, f feel the rewards of everything that they've been missing out on for so many years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, we'll keep manifesting that. Exactly. I love that. So now for the really creative, fun component of this that we were sort of talking about before we uh, pressed record, your different pursuits, the different avenues that you're taking. So I want to talk about Evolving Vegan. Incredible. So you authored this book, you shot this show, really want to know more about it. Obviously, you know, you, you have this passion for storytelling, this passion for cooking. So really tell me where it started. Yeah, it started... Um Back in 2015, really, uh, I went plant-based with two of my best friends. We were living together. We had just graduated theater school and we started going plant-based and I started noticing that I f like, I started feeling a lot better. I started making progress at the gym I'd never made before. Um, and I just noticed that, you know, 
this was kind of a really great thing that that I was doing because we we started off very slowly. You right. know, we cut out eggs first and then we cut out chicken, we cut out beef. It was kind of an experiment we were doing for ourselves. And I think diets, you know, should always be an experiment for people. Um, and so that's kind of where the idea of evolving vegan came from. Like like the idea, not the not the IP, but the idea evolving vegan came from. Um, and I've always been a big fan of food. Uh, my mom's an amazing cook. I love cooking. Uh, I, I grew up watching like Guy Fieri and, and Gordon Ramsay, mm -hmm. um, Anthony Bourdain. So I loved what they did. I was like, that's so cool. You get to travel around and like eat amazing food. Um, and they were engaging and funny and, and intelligent, intellectual. And so I always wanted to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Evolving Vegan came from. And I knew that in order to do the show, you know, the book was just a natural fit because, you know, me and my producing uh, partners at the time, business partners for Evolving Vegan, uh, we traveled around North America. We actually went out and did the thing. We traveled around North America, but it was really for the book. So we had video element to that, but not really. Um, so we did it for the book. And so when we came back, uh, I was like, we, you know, we need to try to sell the book to a publisher. And a lot of the publishers initially didn't really get the idea of it, like a traveling food book for vegans. Like, this is weird. But when they saw the recipes and they saw the photographs, you know, we, we ended up selling the book um, to uh, Tiller Press, uh, Simon & Schuster out of Canada. And they have, a, you know, they have a publishing house called Tiller Press. So um, they bought the book. And then my next... Um, goal under my production company, Press Play Productions, was to then sell the show. And so again, the same thing happened with the show where a lot of, you know, networks were like a traveling food show about vegans. Like this is like, but eventually, um, you know, Bell uh, found out about the show, found out about the book, of course, and uh, they bought the show. So we shot the first season. It's out on Crave Canada and CTV Life. Um, and so, you know, we're hoping to do another season and, and keep this going as long as we can. That's incredible. Honestly, it sounds so great. Um, and in terms of, you know, the show Evolving Vegan, and I'm very curious, you have so much acting experience. How has shooting this been different from, let's say, Aladdin or some of the other things you've shot? You know, it's it's a different dynamic, but it's also just about being real with people and, and getting to, to know these people on a human level. Um, you know, again, that's why I find it so crazy when, you know, people are angry about, you know, me going to a certain spot or promoting a certain spot on the show. It's, it's just like, man, we just like, we're all human. Like, just try to look at it from a human level. Like, just because mm -hmm. you don't agree with what someone is doing or how they're going about something, like there's always value in trying to see where they're coming from. You know, that's. That's the thing that I think we all need to work on more. Everything is so fast now on social media mm -hmm. and like we just all get angry so quickly. We're just like on social media trying to find something to be angry about. It's like we'll all benefit from just trying to understand the person across from us a little better, even if we don't agree with them. Absolutely. And you think in a time where we have access to so much information, we'd We'd, we'd welcome and have more opportunity to continue that learning and deepen that understanding. But oftentimes it's a simple, you know, just as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed, uh, the experience of it and, um, you know, getting to meet these amazing people. It's, you know, it's just, um, I enjoy hosting for what it is, you know, it's performance in a way, but it's just about being real and, 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 you know, being there for the people across from you. And really to unpack the stories of other people and really insert yourself and your own passions as well, right? Because obviously there's that alignment there and you can see that and it, it emulates in your energy through that. So that's something that's really captivating about that. So truly, it's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That. Well, there's something else that I really wanted to touch on um, 
quite inspiring and really, I'm sure, greatly appreciated by many different artists as well uh, and different creatives is your charity that you have, EDA. So please tell us about that. I have so many questions. Yeah, um, the Ethnically Diverse Artist Association. Um, yeah, I started it back in 2019, and basically we're a non-for-profit organization. We try to help ethnically diverse artists in any way that we can, whether it's um, getting new headshots or you know, there's a specialized dance class they want to take. We help them, you know, pay for that, and so they can take the class and advance their career. Um, it's it's gone on hold the last year or so just because. Um, it, it's hard raising money for charities, especially when COVID happened, you know, people were really holding on tight to their money. They weren't donating as much. And so, you know, I can only take the charity as far as, as we have funding for, mm -hmm. and we helped out a few artists. Um, and, and then we kind of, our funding kind of ran dry. So it's been in a little bit of a holding pattern since then, but basically we're non for profit. So, uh, no one ever took a salary or anything like that. Everybody was a volunteer. Um, and all the money went towards helping out artists. Um, unfortunately, some of the artists, we just ran out of money and we, we couldn't help them, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just kind of keeping it afloat now uh, until we can raise more money for it and, and, and I think do it in a do it in a more efficient and effective way, hire someone full time so they can help me run it um, and do that. But, um, you know, basically that's that's the concept of it. We, we try to aid artists to help push their career further in any way that we can. Um, and, you know, hopefully some artists uh, saw benefit from it and, and were able to, um, you know, take some resources away away uh, from their experience with EDA. Absolutely. And I'm sure there are so many people that are, are are grateful to have been able to utilize this resource or now be educated and have awareness. That, wow, there's this resource out there. Right. And to just kind of go into a little bit more about diversity, like let's say, you know, in the film industry, for example, this is why this really intrigued me is this is this is another conversation that continues to be had. And it's something that is is top of mind for a lot of people. What are your thoughts on, you know, diversity in film, let's say, and and where can we bridge those gaps to continue to improve that? I've I've been on a roller coaster the way I view this. You know, like I said, my first role uh, for actor, you know, under the actor union was was mm -hmm. Al Qaeda number two. And I think we've come a long way. We don't really see many shows about that subject matter anymore, which is great because uh, for a while Arabs were just associated with being terrorists. Um, and I think that's why I'm really proud of Aladdin, too. I think it was proof to the world and proof to the studios that you could make a film with basically an all ethnic cast and it not be something negative. And, you know, it went on to, to make over a billion dollars, which is, you know, a great return for the studios. So hopefully that kind of shows the studios that, Hey, you, you can do this. Um, but I think it's still a fight. It's still a struggle. I think what I have to remind myself of is this stuff takes time. Uh, like African Americans, black African Americans in Hollywood had to fight for, decades and decades to get to where they are now. Um, and, and I would say that now, you know, they're in a pretty good place. It can always be better, but they're in a pretty good place. But that took time. It took decades and generations of artists fighting for the Will Smiths of the world and, mm -hmm. and fighting for the Denzel Washingtons of the world. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's going to take that same fight for every other minority group out there. Um, and so, you know, I can't speak to, to a lot of them except the one that I'm a part of, which is, you know, Middle Easterns and North Africans. It's going to take a lot more people to, to fight for our place in the industry. And that's why I started EDA. That's why, you know, at Press Play Productions, my production company, that's what we fight for. We fight to, to bridge the gap between the East and the West. So we, we licensed uh, one of Stephen King's short stories, The Doctor's Case. And uh, our short film was called The Last King, but it was with an all Persian cast. It was all in Farsi. Um, and so that's kind of what we try to do. I have an Arabic film coming out called In Broad Daylight. It was an all Arabic film in Egypt that we shot in Egypt and Turkey. Um, that's going to be primarily for the Egyptian market, but it's an all Arabic film and we helped co-produce that. So we're really trying to bring awareness to, you know, 
Middle East and North African culture um, and artists as well. But I do think it's going to take a long, you know, it's going to take a long time to do that. These things don't happen overnight. And I think that's what I've realized over the years is you can spend your time being angry and bitter about it, or you can just slowly work towards making it better. And Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the avenue that I've taken is just slowly trying to make it better, you know? Uh, do, you know, playing, playing characters called Prince Thomas on a number one Netflix film. That's, that's a win, you know, that's a slow move in the right direction. Um, you know, Rami Youssef having a number one show on Hulu. That's a great win. That's a move in the right direction. And it's just going to take a lot of those, a lot of those wins. Um, but if we can, you know, slowly inch towards that Rami Malek winning an Oscar, that's a great win. That's, you know, a step in the right direction. So we've just got to put those as many of those steps as we can forward. And eventually, you know, hopefully it'll just be, hopefully it'll be flawless for the, for the generation that comes after us. You know, that that's basically the goal. You know, it's interesting. I don't know. um, I don't know exactly how the saying goes, but it's something along the lines of, you know, keep, keep practicing, keep taking that action, keep taking those little steps because it's actually preparing you for the big show. You don't know when that show's coming, but it's the little things that are going to make a difference, such as the things you mentioned, right? What you're doing, it's certainly, it's certainly something to be proud of. And that is, that is top of mind. And hopefully, as you mentioned, it will be flawless for the generations to come. Thanks. Yeah, I hope so. Um, And to kind of go back, this sort of brings me back um, and has more questions to sort of the strike that's taking place. So diversity is top of mind for a lot of people, especially with, you know, in the film industry, we have this strike Um, in terms of, you know, what we covered at the top of this conversation, the heart of, you know, what the movement is. We've got compensation, artificial intelligence, the streaming sort of all of that, especially in, in, in Canada, so to speak, we heavily rely on the U S for so much, right. When it comes to Canadian film, if negotiations, let's say don't come to a resolution and we can't figure it out because of how heavily we rely on the U S what are your projections or just your opinion on how that will affect the Canadian market specifically? Yeah, I think, you know, everyone says Canada's like the little brother to to the U.S. Um, I do think that I don't know the exact mandates in Canada, but uh, I think I read an article about how uh, Canada's looking to bring more international projects to Mm -hmm. shoot in Toronto, because right now the majority of the projects we shoot in Canada are either Canadian or American. So I definitely think that's something that, you know, would benefit Canada, like like anything, right? Diversifying, whether right. you're, you know, investing or, you know, you. I think diversifying is a good thing to do, right? To mitigate risk. And so I think it's the same for the industry. Uh, if Canada can attract more international productions to come shoot here, that mitigates the risk and makes us less reliant on, you know, the United States or, or, or one specific industry. Um, you know, like there's a massive industry in Bollywood. Like it'd be great to get some Bollywood productions to shoot in Canada, uh, especially with our diversity here and our multiculturalism. And we just have a really good sense of community here and accepting other people. Um, so I think that would, that would be a good thing to do. And, um, you know, supporting Canadians as well. That's something that uh, is at the forefront of, of what I do as well. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm super, super happy and grateful that a Canadian broadcaster picked up Evolving Vegan and I, you know, it's a Canadian show. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important too, is to always come back to where you're from and support where you're from. So I hope other Canadians who, you know, go stateside, find success, come back to Canada and always find a way to do stuff. Um, you know, Lily Singh is another great artist that does that. She comes back to Canada and works here. Uh, she has a show out, uh, you know, that she's doing with Belle as well. And so I think it's really important to do that, to differentiate ourselves, not just from stateside, but also just to, you know, support Canadians and, and, and um, champion Canadians that have found success. So on that note of championing Canadians that have found that success, let's say you're new in the industry, right? You've got students, let's say, currently in film school. 
or even younger than that, that have these aspirations to break into the industry or you're still early on in your career, do you think this is posing maybe thoughts in people's minds about look at the strike that's taking place right now? What does the future of film look like? Can I pursue and have a successful career in this or somebody in it starting to maybe rethink this? Yeah, I think um, I forget who the actor was, but I think a bunch of actors have come out and said this um, like, you know, older actors, you know, that have been around a long time. I think the days of just being an actor and making a good living just doing that are over. Um, I think if you're extremely lucky, you can still you can still pull that off, uh, you know, but um, even with you know, what I've done, um, in my career, being an actor just isn't enough nowadays. And again, it goes back to residuals, not being as, as much as they used to and things just getting more expensive. But, um, I don't think you can be strictly an actor and, and make the same kind of living that you used to. And so I think it is important to try to figure out, um, what else it is you're going to do? Are you, are you going to produce on the side? Are you going to write on the side? Uh, you know, are you going to direct on the side uh, or not even on the side, just, just to supplement what you're doing. So I think that's really important. That's what I would say to young artists coming up is, you know, go, go full throttle on what it is you want to do. If it's acting, go full throttle on that, but also try to expand off of that. You know, are you going to write a book? Uh, you know, in the evenings when you're not working, are you going to direct some short films? Are you going to learn how to produce? Like, what is it else that you're going to do? Because all that stuff benefits your acting at the end of the day. And I think it's just extremely difficult now and in the past, but more now to make a living strictly off of acting. I think you can do it. There's no doubt about it. It also just depends what you want to do. Like mm -hmm. if you just want to do movies, it's hard to make a living doing movies now. Like you make more money doing TV, much more money. Um, if, if money is all you're looking at, it's better to book a series regular on a big show and just do that for as many years as you can than to try to do movies. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard making a good living just doing movies. Um, so it just depends what you want to do and um, doing your research. And obviously, listen, this is all relative, right? It depends how you wanna live. It depends what, right. your, what your definition of success is, what your definition of a good life is, what your definition of financial freedom is. It, it, it's all relative, but you know, it's, it's certainly harder, I think, nowadays. So would you say then the strike makes that reality more apparent than ever before? Um. Maybe, you know, it's it's definitely a shift that's happening right now, but, um, you know, hopefully we get the strike over with and then we don't have one for another 50, 100 years. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it's unfortunate that it's happening right now. But like you said, the last time there was a dual strike was in 1960. Um, you know, that was like 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago. So hopefully the next one doesn't happen for another 60 years. And so mm -hmm. this generation might not even have to worry about it. Um, so... You know, it's it's definitely, I think, a symbol that things are rapidly changing. Like I said, when when I was in theater school, you heard a lot about residuals. You heard a, about the amount of money you could make um, if you booked something successful that you know brought tons of residuals with it. That doesn't happen anymore. So mm -hmm. times are changing, the industry's changing, and you've got to be malleable and 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 have an open mind to you know, pivoting, you've got to pivot, um, when, and if necessary. Do you think that there's something that film creatives can, can, can start thinking about in terms of leveraging how quickly things are changing? So for example, artificial intelligence, right? Especially actors, they, they want to have ownership over, over, over their own likeness. They don't want, you know, artificial intelligence to be affecting that. What can other creatives look into? Is there a way to sort of leverage or pivot against some of these to use to their advantage rather well how if you, quickly things are changing if you want to have ultimate ownership of what you do then go out and create your own stuff that's what i would say and then you mm -hmm. don't have to worry about ai and and any of this um you know if ownership is what you're focused on and you're going how can i you know 
be in complete control of what I do. I mean, that's why actors start production companies. It's it's why they do that. Um, and actors at any level, you know, actors at my level, actors that are way, you know, way more successful than I am, actors, you know, who are just starting out. That's why actors start their own production companies. And it, it's something that is as old as, as time, you know, like theater troops. Actors used to start theater troops. Would, mm -hmm. They would start their clan of of theater actors and they would get together and they would tour countries and put on a show and they would own that show and they loved what they did and it was like a family and that's what they did. Like this has existed since the beginning of time. Um, if you don't want someone else to own what you do, then there's ways to do it. Like, you know, start your own production company, um, figure out what you want to produce, try to go out and get it independently financed. Um, and then you drop the contracts, you structure it the way you want and you own it. Um, and then you license it and you know, that's, it's been done. It's been done. It continues to be done and it will continue to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, not as much now as it used to, that's for sure because things are more expensive. You might not have the resources. Um, you know, the, the television game is pretty much a studio game. I mean, it's, it's hard to get television independently financed, but it happened. I mean, it just happened with that, uh, with that Bible series. I, I forget what it's called, but the, the series about the Bible and, and Jesus Christ, you know, that, that mm -hmm. was crowdfunded. Um, and so they did that and it's incredibly successful. So mm -hmm. You can still do it, you know, you just got to find a way if that's what you want. And then finally, on that note, in terms of all the picketing and the amount of people that are banding together to really exercise their their, you know, their voices and and in, in their mind, do what's right and fight for these things that they want. Is there something else that they can do or maybe something else they can say? Obviously, you know, we're just having a conversation here, but you know, you get enough people together, you want to see change, what else can be done? Is there anything else that people can do to fight to be fairly compensated to get these residuals to not have AI take over to still have this love and feel like you're getting this full value and benefit out of the film industry, especially Canadians that rely so heavily on the US? I think just standing together is important. I think, you know, when you sign up to be a part of a union, um, like the word itself is pretty self-explanatory. It's a union together. And so I think just supporting the union, supporting your fellow actors is, is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are something called interim waivers that are going around that are still allowing actors to work. I think that should be celebrated. That's good. Uh, that's a good thing that actors can still work and do certain projects. Um, other projects are not affected. Uh, like if you're, you know, doing a non-scripted show, those for the most part are not affected. Um, and so, you know, just standing together and being patient, it's hard. Uh, it's really, really tough. Um, you know, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it sucks, you know, but just stand together and be patient. And I truly do believe I could be completely wrong, but I truly do believe it's going to come to an end. Um, hopefully the writers, you know, come to an agreement soon with the studios and then that kind of kind of, you know, lead the way to the actors coming to an agreement as well. But I do feel like the end is near and um, just got to trust our union that they're going to make the right decisions and, and do the right things and, um, you know, just stand together as much as we can. And I guess as well, make enough of make the right decision to have, you know, as many people happy with it as possible. Right. Because it's one thing for them to come to a decision, but then to a decision that for the most part is is in agreement with what they're fighting for or to, you know, be fairly compensated, all of that. Yeah, I've negotiated a lot of contracts, um, you know, I've been involved in a lot of contracts and, and nobody's ever happy. Like that's 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 the thing. It's like, you know, both sides always feel like they could have gotten more. Both sides feel like they um you know they didn't get enough or, mm -hmm. or they they you know they 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 let go of things so it, it is what it is but you know at the end of the day i think an agreement is an agreement um so as long as both sides come to terms then they're always going to feel like they could have gotten more but um mm -hmm. i think what's important now is just finding the middle ground you know just just find the middle ground and let's get this 
you know, let's get this industry back on its feet. Because like I said, it's not even the strike. It's like COVID, you know, shut everything down yeah. for a long time. And now it's shut down again. And it's just like, you know, you just want to get the ball rolling and, and momentum uh, going. Well, fingers crossed. And like you said earlier, all steps in the right direction, right? Yeah. Truly, that's all we can do. Hopefully they can come up with an agreement that for the most part is satisfactory, you know, to everybody and can can make all of it worth it. Right. Yeah, it'll be worth it. It'll be worth it. Um, I, I truly believe that, um, you know, like I said, I think at the forefront, everybody will find a reason to complain about it. Yeah. Um, but I think it'll be worth it in the end. I think it's already been worth it. So uh, I, I, I that's if, if I had to predict something, I would say this this will be wrapped up by the end of the year um, for both the writers and the actors unions. Um, it'll be wrapped up by the end of the year. But you know, it'll take a while for things to, to get going again, but that's just the, uh, the reality of the size of the beast. Yeah. And you know, this, this time of year too, is the number one time when, you know, Canada shoots their, their holiday films, for example. So hopefully things will get decided sooner than later. Um, thank you so much for, you know, all of your insights on that. Um, and finally, before we wrap this, I'm sure people listening are going to be eager to know as well, what do you have going on in your pipeline? What can we expect? Any exciting projects that you can share? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I can't talk about some of it because of the strikes. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll be starting my own podcast actually. So thank you for this. It's been great to come in and 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 learn from you and see what's going on. Uh, I'll be starting my own podcast called Growth Untold. We're really going to be focusing on uh, you know doing exactly that, telling stories of 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 growth from people that you may not have heard about before. Um, I think that you know, the people that inspire me the most are like people that have been working for years and you may have not heard of them. And then all of a sudden you hear about them and you're like, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Christoph Waltz, Pedro Pascal, um, you know, there, there, there's tons of actors like that, that seemingly come out of nowhere. Uh, but they've been doing this a long time. And we're not just going to focus on actors. We're focusing on entrepreneurs, um, on, you know, people, executives and in, in high positions at companies, you know. Uh, so we've we've got some really interesting people that we're going to be interviewing. And really the point of the podcast is to inspire people um, to push, to work hard and that you can gain success. And not everyone that's successful is famous. There are tons of incredibly successful people out there that you know nothing about that you've probably never heard about um that are living amazing lives and doing what they love and mm -hmm. succeeding and and growing and pushing forward and then you know we hope to also host people that you have heard about but maybe you haven't heard about a particular story a particular journey with them and we want to bring that to the forefront um so that's my podcast called growth untold i'll be doing that with my childhood best friend i've known him since we were um eight years old or i think even six years old and um I've got my film In Broad Daylight coming out. That's an Arabic language film. Uh, I started that film three years ago in Egypt. It's taken a while to uh, get it done and 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 have it premiere. So that'll hopefully be premiering uh, this year in theaters in Egypt and North America. There are certain uh, specialty theaters in North America that um, uh, you know that promote and and show uh, Bollywood films and Egyptian films, and so uh, it'll be coming out uh soon it's called in broad daylight um and uh you know yeah hopefully some good news about evolving vegan as well but right now you can watch the first season on crave canada um or ctv life so we're we're really excited by by that and press play productions we've got some some other stuff in the pipeline that we're we're excited about so uh i'll talk about that as, as soon as i can Amazing. Well, thank you so much. We certainly have a lot on the go that I'm going to be keeping up with. I know a lot of people are super excited to keep up with as well. And certainly is a testament to your passion for storytelling and just, you know, your your creative element. So thank you so much for everything, for being here, for being present with us. It was truly um, it was truly a privilege and a great conversation. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank mm -hmm. you.